So good morning, Kiev and Tokyo. My name is Vasil Marosnichenko. I'm a partner of CFC Big Ideas strategic communication company. I would like to thank the New Europe Center for the trust and for the opportunity to moderate this discussion. As you know, Nova Europa Center conducts a number of interesting discussions dedicated to Ukrainian and Japanese relations. And we we're talking today about how to change and how to improve um, the Ukrainian reputation in Japan, to improve uh, the image of Ukraine, how to battle stereotypes and bust myths that can exist. And we can also talk about what can, you, what can Japan do in Ukraine furthermore to spread better information, more information, more news, and to increase attractivity of Japan and Ukraine. So we talk about uh, culture, diplomacy, and the tools that we have. And probably most important in this discussion is that for, for, to promote Ukraine in the world, it's important to understand the specifics of the countries who we communicate with. And the, Japan is the best example in that because really we cannot form any general established image or a program that we can promote both, both in the US and Europe, Western Europe and Asia. And this adaptation is very important because that ties back to mindset of the people, the culture, philosophy, and habits to perceive a certain information. So we have interesting speakers today from Japan, from Ukraine, who understand that these topics, and I'm confident we're gonna have a very interesting discussion. Everybody who's watching us on Facebook or YouTube, please post questions. You can write your questions in the comment section and after the presentations, I will be asking those questions. And please um, indicate whom do you direct this question to, the entire panel or someone personally, and I will then um, give it voice. So let me give you the author of an analytical note that is called How to Rebrand Ukraine in Japan and vice versa. This is Takashi Hirano, who is the head of Japanese section in Ukraine Forum. He's been from studying Ukraine for many years. He started uh, in Tokyo University, Eastern European in Studies, then University of Franco, worked in U Japanese embassy in Ukraine, now helps the Ukrainian forum to create J uh, Japanese language content. So Mr. Hirano, the floor is yours. Um, so let's, let's share your analytical note and the recommendations that you arrived to. Thank you, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation and for the opportunity to write this comment. I will start talking about the general overview of my note, of my comment. I think uh, over the last years in Ukraine, we've had enough dis sufficient discussions about strategy or the goal or reasons why we should do public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy and what has to be done and why is it important. But on the other hand, if we see what's happening locally in Japan, not always there's great results or efficacy of what you want to show or showcase. So that's why in my comment, I focused attention on how to provide this result, how to adapt the content in order to increase the efficacy and awareness of Ukraine in Japan or about Ukraine in Japan. And we know that in general, um, to rebrand something, to rebrand uh, Ukraine in Japan is to raise awareness about Ukraine in Japan. And there is a big space for maneuver there. So first of all, I would like to say that it's very important to understand the perception of information by the Japanese, by Japan. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of historical factors. The Japanese take information radically different than Ukrainians. 
And if you don't understand it, then your efficacy may be very low. For instance, a great example can be the world the word Europe in Japanese. For Ukrainians, it's a obvious word. Ukraine is Europe, and there is a consensus that what is Europe. But if you to look at the perception of this word in Japan, then it's different. For instance, when they hear the word Europe, they associate it with things like nice, cultural, historic, and such. Not diplom, not democracy or freedom, as you perceive it. So if Ukraine says Ukraine is Europe, so that to the Japanese understand that you have they have great history and great culture, not necessarily democracy. If you want to say something about democracy and freedom, then you probably have to say that Ukrainian Ukraine is a democratic country, is a free country like Japan. And then they understand that we are similar in that way. Just as well, Ukrainians often say that Japan is an exotic country. Uh, clear why because we have a huge distance and we don't necessarily know much about each other so surprisingly for Japanese Ukraine is an exotic country for the same reason and very often you don't understand what exotic means what exotic elements for the Japanese are there in Ukraine what can that be additional potential to get your Japanese interested. So you have to have a dialogue with local population. You have to have a study how to perceive, how they perceive Ukraine. I think that the great example can be is the Kupala or, or Malanka, things that don't exist in other countries. They can get additional interest but the same uh, way European context, modernity, they have some image of that, but that's general things that are also there in other countries. So they have completely different um, context during the uh, uh, raising awareness of the image of Ukraine. After 2013, in general, the attention towards Ukraine has increased in Japan. And they are have more interest in towards Ukraine. But the, there's a problem with the lack of information about Ukraine in Japan, in Japanese language. So they want to know more, but there's a lack of information. So they don't, they don't understand entirely what kind of country Ukraine is. They only know that after dissolution of the USSR, the Ukraine has only 30 years of language, of uh, history, and that doesn't serve well to awareness reasons. You have to talk about a thousand years uh, of history of Ukraine with uh, Japanese language. Just as well about U U Crimea. For seven years, we hear that Crimea is Ukraine, and we know that from the day one. Japanese, Japanese believe that Crimea is Ukraine, but on the other hand, at the same time, we often don't know what is the logic that Ukrainians use, that international law understands that, but there's a lack of information. What kind of land is Crimea? What history is there? And you also have to provide this information in good quality Japanese language. And also about cuisine, about food. This is specificity of the Japanese. They like to associate a certain country with a certain cooking, with a certain food or certain travels in this country as an opportunity to try local dishes to understand this country. And it's great that in the recent times, Ukrainian Institute has presented a new uh, visual aid about Ukrainian cuisine, and it's a very positive step. But just as well, you have to translate it in good quality Japanese language. 
And I would like to stress uh, that a good quality a Japanese language is important, but it doesn't mean that technically a uh, high level of Japanese language command. It's only part of that. It's very important that in parallel do they understand how they perceive the translation. Sometimes it's, it sounds well in Ukrainian, but after translation, this effect is lost somehow. And sometimes just to, you have to create or recreate the new text, the new sentence by putting the elements of the original into the material. And it's very important. So that's why you have to provide the people, the translators who have a great command of the Japanese language on a high level. Another thing about the Jap Japan and Ukraine, one more thing. Unlike Ukraine, in Japan, Japan has a certain reputation in Ukraine. Many people know about Japan. But the problem is that there's a lack of the Japanese counterparts cannot uh, cannot provide this demand. So the task is to increase the, the information. And it's not only the embassy's job. The embassy, the embassy has to coordinate the efforts. Those of those people who can talk, who can write about Japan and Ukraine. So the Japanese experts in Ukraine or Japanese uh, knowledgeable people in Ukraine. So for instance, having an, a, a monthly competition for the best content about Japan that can be a very interesting tool to increase information if the embassy will announce every month a competition for the best video or best text about japan then it's going to be an additional motivation for the authors brokers or journalists bloggers and for the society it's going to be more attention towards the country and so that creates a synergy to increase the level of uh, awareness. And it's important that it's not only the task of a government of Ukraine and, or Japan in general, and it, to improve the soft power is the task for everybody involved. Everybody's interested. It's clear that the Japanese soft power is not created by the Japanese government, it's by the Japanese people. And it's important to understand from Ukraine. Okay, that that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Hirano. When I read it, I understood the most important that other than a good command of Japanese language, which we have to use when we promote the positive image of Ukraine in Japan, there's also a peculiarity that we often ignore, ignore or even shy away from when we deal with the Western world. And it's our culture that is related to old times with this rural history, the rural traditions, the embroidery, things that often in the modern progressive discourse, they get ignored. And we try to talk about modern things, but forgetting about the historical things. So in case of Japan, this is something that we have to stress because the, the Japanese respect to their national costume, to their culture. They learn other cultures through this prism. So Ukrainian embroidery, traditional costumes is something that they can that, that can be very interesting to them. So I learned about the phenomenon of Ukrainian bandura. My mother used to play the bandura. It's a musical instrument, and I know that it's an instrument that has a lot of interest in Japan and there are Ukrainian artists who reside in Japan and they play bandura and Japanese like it. So these accents with borscht, with our national cuisine and food, those things are very interesting to Japanese, to the Japanese and that's they, what, they, what they would like to see and 
see. Violeta Odovic would like to pass the floor to her. She's the second secretary of the Ukrainian uh, embassy in Japan. She's now um, for a short while with us. And she's participating the meeting with the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, but we'd like her to comment on this topic. Violeta, okay, thank you. Thank you, Vasil. Thank you, friends, greetings. I'd like to, first of all, thank, thank the Nova Europa Center for the invitation to join in this, this event. I'm happy that these events are happening. And as a student of Ukrainian-Japanese relations, I would like to greet Mr. Herano with the wonderful analytical note. I have read it. And I agree also that we need to stress the ancient history of Ukraine, the traditions. So we do, we talk about Vanakapala, about Malanka and other traditional um, things and also technological potential because Japan is the country of well-developed high technology. So my comment would like to dedicate it to the tools how can we promote the image of Ukraine in Japan? And also stress that we all understand that especially today in the pandemic time, so the most important tools is internet and also social networks. And I think we've talked about it for, for a while. Last year, uh, Sergei Konsulski account in Twitter was registered, which, uh, who uses this actively to provide information about the culture, history, traditions of Ukraine, about the folk art. So Mr. Ambassador also asked all the Ukrainians who have relations with Japan and know Japanese language to open these accounts and to talk about Ukraine. And we see that a lot, there are a lot of um, people who follow this path, that's great. I'd like to also say that with social networks, social networks related to the media, after the active digital diplomacy started, we've seen a very positive response from the Japanese mass media, who started calling the embassy and asking for a comment or an interview of the ambassador regarding that account, the diplomacy, tell, tell us about Ukrainian borscht, we have a program about Ukrainian Karavai. So they hear about that, they read about that, and there's this wave, and it's going to be getting stronger and bigger. And we hope, as uh, Hirano said when he said about the work of uh, Japanese embassy in Ukraine, that it's not only the governmental work to promote Japan and Ukraine. Just as well, I believe, and I fully agree with this, idea that it's very important for us as an embassy and for all Ukrainians in general to get to partners and friends of Ukraine in Japan. Mr. Okawa will be speaking today. He's the president of Association of Ukrainian um, Knowledge and Studies, Ukrainian Studies in Japan it's from 1994. And they try to increase knowledge about Ukraine. We also have two the brotherly cities, Kyoto, Kiev, Yokohama, Odessa. And based on these relations, we also have uh, their support in promoting Ukraine on the regional level. Just before the Olympics, there were agreements signed on cooperation between the host town program. So Japanese cities who will host our Ukrainian team and they also promote Ukraine. They do exhibitions. We had a wonderful project with Hino City with postal marks um, who were sold out in the several days. So we want to engage our Japanese friends more and more. For us, it's very important to have proactive Ukrainian community in Japan because that's in the best interest of all Ukrainians so that um, they know about our country. They know the positive sides of our country. In Japan, currently, there's a big, there are three Ukrainian schools. I'd like to give you a great news that on the April 2nd, we plan to open Ukrainian school in Nagoya city. It's a project that is implemented with support of Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs Ukraine. 
and we also cooperate with Japanese Ukrainian Cultural Association uh, in city Nagoya. Also in Tokyo, there are two Ukrainian schools, Jarelse School and also Skrobachok School, which was the second official registered organization that has the name Association of Partners of uh, Ukraine in Japan. It's a bureaucratic comment, but it's important because if there is no official registration, our ministry cannot provide support within the budgetary programs that exist today to support um, Ukrainians abroad. The last important thing is that we want very much and we want to support businesses uh, related to Ukraine. There are already ideas to open Ukrainian uh, restaurant in Japan. We as an embassy will provide as, as much information as we can. Also, the shops selling Ukrainian produce, Ukrainian food. So it's also possible, it also helps for Ukraine to break through to the mass market. When the Japanese go to the supermarket and buy Ukrainian candy, and they read Ukrainian newspapers, and also they, have, they subscribe to Twitter account of the ambassador. So we want from each side they, so that they know more about Ukraine. The last comment, it's very important, as Hirano said, as Vasil said, an important element is the localization of cultural content and, and know and finding shared interest, learning about tastes and interests of Ukrainian of Japanese um, audience, and of course the language factor. Of course, uh, let's more actively speak and learn Ukraine uh, Japanese. Thank you for the attention, and thanks for the new Nova Europa Center. Thank you, Violetta. It's a relevant comment about social networks and about how to use them. And of course, using the new technologies, we can cheaply create the content uh, that we can spread. So if we understand how much uh, Ukrainian advertisement cost on Japanese TV, that could be very expensive, but on the other hand, if we have interesting content on Facebook and Twitter, our audience can get a better outreach. So it's a great example where Twitter account provokes interest from traditional media, the media, the TV, the, the print, who so started uh, inviting people from the embassy thanks to Twitter. And it's a unique thing. And I keep talking about that when I talk to the Minister of Foreign Affairs so that the Ukrainian ambassadors have to have their Twitter in the language of a country where they reside or in international language English and less to write Ukrainian because their audience is not in Kiev. It's in the country of their residence. And it's a great example with Japan that uh, a successful Twitter in English uh, dedicated topics that are interested to Japanese that provokes interest from traditional media and it does coverage, gives coverage that otherwise we could never afford. I would like to pass the floor to Volodymyr Shaiko, General Director of the Ukrainian Institute. Volodymyr, for three years, is the head of this institute. He worked in the British Council before, talking about public diplomacy. Volodymyr, I give the floor to you. I know that Ukraine should have done a survey in Japan regarding the perception of Ukraine, maybe a couple of words about that, and also some of your ideas of, about the possible improvements. Thank you, Vasil. Greetings, dear colleagues. Thank you for the invitation from the Uva Europa Center to the talk. And it's great that we have this talk still happening after the recent forum that we've just started to unfold the cultural presence of Ukraine in Japan and vice versa. I'm very thankful for the continuation of this talk that the preliminary result will, is the analytical note of Mr. Hirano. We thank you for that. It sums up greatly the content of our talks during the forum. And thank you for referring to the study of perception of Ukraine in Japan that the Ukrainian Institute has uh, conducted last year. And I'm also happy that uh, to see that the hypothesis in that study and in the report those hypotheses were supported by you 
And I think it's great start for Ukraine for systemic rethinking how to represent ourselves in Ukraine based on verified data collected from the expert community, not only uh, by our own individual image, how Ukrainian, how Ukraine is, what Ukraine is. So in this context, it's very important to have your analytical note, which said that we not always are perceived abroad the way we want to be perceived. And it's often a great mistake, uh, not only in Ukraine, but other countries who try to communicate themselves ab abroad, is to focus on something that we believe is interesting about ourselves. And we think less about what's interesting for them. Do they see it that, that way? So your example about European Ukraine, it's very illustrative that indeed European is a word means something different to other people, other values, um, and something cultural, something Asian, something, but not democratic, not something free as part of the free world. world. And it's important also to understand that's an important uh, idea that I got from you. Always test your hypotheses of Ukrainian cultural diplomacy on people who can provide professional uh, reflection on that content. Because again, we see that in the work of many actors, both state and non-state actors who deal with cultural relations between Ukraine and other countries. Yeah, we also, we always want to talk, some, to say something that we believe is interesting about us, but we have to be more inventive. So what Ukrainian Institute does, to me personally, I don't always like everything as a consumer of cultural product from what we represent abroad, what we communicate. Because I understand that it's not about my tastes and what I, what I like. It is about what other people, institutions and other nation likes. Also, it's important uh, in, in what you said, in splitting Ukraine and Russia and Crimea, working with Ukrainian studies in Japan, because that is the source and that is the space where scientific knowledge is born, which later gets into the school books and the media and experts community. So I think that this cultural diplomacy uh, is underappreciated. We don't think much about where do stereotypes get, um, are born from? How do we form these stereotypes? Those stereotypes, um, have been born over some time and economic and scientific community has to do with it. It's great that there are association of Ukrainian studies in Japan. And we want to learn um, and to know how to spread this kind of knowledge in Japan more because the potential for further multiplication is big. Also, it was very valuable point that you said at the beginning, the lack of established cultural associations in Japan about Ukraine. It's, it's the problem. So we, we can talk about Ukraine as a country of uh, dynamic people, creative people, inventive people, industrious people. It's all very good, but it doesn't form some kind of unique uh, image of Ukraine abroad because there are a lot of such countries that communicate like that. So it would be interesting to to talk about this.
to know some kind of unique proposals which would associ be associated uh, with Ukraine and be our visiting card, business card. I support about culinary diplomacy, the potential of uh, national cuisine to, to make it popular among the wide audience. It's a very prospective uh, direction. And thank you for mentioning our culinary diplomacy. We want to translate it in Japanese. We, we know that uh, the ambassador was very enthusiastic about that. This uh, book is being translated in French and Portuguese. Our embassy abroad was um, wanted to do that, but there can be a lot of activities around this book, uh, which would strengthen the image of Ukrainian cuisine through which you can talk about our ancient culture, history of regional, regional peculiarities or ethnical um, context. So in those markers that you listed in the note that Ukraine is a dynamic, creative, democratic, I think another marker is missing too. So Ukraine is a cultural thing. We want Ukraine to be known in Japan as a country with cultural potential. And I'm confident that our documentaries, independent theater, visual arts, literature, movies, all that deserves to become a brand uh, building thing in Japan, not only because they're valuable uh, by themselves, the Ukrainian cultural content, but through it and through culture, it's the best way to, to translate the history of Ukraine, to get uh, foreigners knowledgeable about it, our daily life, our mindset, our sentiments, and it's a powerful retranslator of public cultural diplomacy. And we want Ukraina uh, Kulturna to be an important association for the Japanese about Ukraine. And just a small reference, I have been pre preparing for this talk. I remember that our neighbors in Poland, Institute of Adam Mickiewicz, their Institute of Cultural Diplomacy has a separate Asian program that focuses uh, Poland activity um, in Japan and Korea and China. And I went to their website to see what are they doing, their Asian program. And basically that's what um, it's about integration of Polish artists in local cultural platforms, movie festivals, museums, uh, in existing cultural infrastructure, publications about Poland. So about Crimea, about our history, it's a, it's a cultural PL website. It's a big portal through which Poland translates their cultural diplom diplomacy abroad. And it's social networks through which they're actively promoting information about Polish culture. I think that's a great example for us as a country, who neighbor, neighbors, in terms of uh, the Japanese viewers. Um, we, we, we in Poland uh, look similar on the mental map. I see Madame Olga, things differently, but I think these tools that we were talking about, they will be effective and Ukrainians should use them. And if there's time uh, to talk about that, no, we can leave it for later because I want that each of our viewers have equal time for speaking. I would like to comment at the topic about working with academic circles. Because it's not only the problem of Japan, those 
those scientists who first studied um, Soviet world and their worldview is, was shaped back then with Russian culture. And even now when they write about things happening in Ukraine, they still use Russian sources and they perceive everything through Russian context. And it's a problem in Japan as well. And we have to do something. So one of the ideas would be to en engage the young um, students and doctor students to go to exchange programs to Ukraine. So there's a monthly program for doctors, for representatives of other Asian countries who come over to Ukraine. So they come over to Ukraine and how important it is in their perception of Ukraine, how they will uh, perceive all this. But now I'd like to give, pass the floor to Sugimoto Satosha, head of the Japanese Agency of Cooperation. Um, so this talk will be in English. So you can select the language you would like. Mr. Sugimoto has worked for 30 years in, in the Japanese Agency of International Development. He's been recently in Ukraine, before that in Cambodia and Kenya, Vietnam, and now works in Kiev. So Mr. Sugimoto, I pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Basil san And uh, today, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, New European Center for invitation to myself. And it is my uh, great pleasure to join this discussion for rebranding Ukraine in Japan and vice versa today. Uh, today's topic sounds very exciting. And uh, I have a lot of ideas I'd like to share. But uh, however, uh, I found that uh, uh, analytical commentary prepared by Mr. Hirano has already well uh, summarized uh, the, the various critical points including uh, most of my points as well. So therefore, uh, today I try to share uh, some supplemental information uh, to it. And I hope uh, it will contribute to, for the further and better understanding uh, of the commentary, especially for Ukrainian friends. And also uh, it will uh, contribute to deepen the uh, today's discussions. So I try to uh, uh, cover uh, mainly three points. Uh, first one, uh, information and knowledge about Ukraine in Japan. Uh, second, uh, common culture aspect or in two countries. And uh, uh, thirdly, uh, rebranding approach for Japanese people. And uh, uh, such a, uh, what I'm going to discuss, uh, uh, say uh, is Pama Pasha from my uh, 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 work career in JICA and uh, I have my passion from my uh, personal experience as a very ordinary Japanese. But firstly, uh, information about the uh, uh, knowledge about uh, Ukraine, Japan. Uh, it also uh, mentioned in the, uh, the commentary, but today, uh, as one uh, example of the common background in Japan, uh, I tried to review the information of Ukraine, uh, of, about U information about Ukraine in the textbook of the Japanese high school. Now the almost all the Japanese uh, go, uh, go and graduate the high school level education so it could be a good uh, kind of say the standard uh, of the very common knowledge uh, shared in Japan. And the first case uh, is world his textbook of world history. Uh, world history is one of the, the mandatory subject in high school. Uh, this time I checked uh, the re very recent version of the, uh, the textbook. And uh, as a result, uh, my, um, uh, even uh, for myself, it's a bit shocking result, but I just found only some piece of information in it, actually, uh, such as Keith Ruth, uh, uh, the name of uh, Holy uh, World Mill, uh, era of uh, Lithuania, uh, Russian Revolution, establishment and the collapse of Soviet Union. And also, I found the uh, uh, name of uh, Kiev city uh, in the map of textbook, but uh, 
Unfortunately, major parts of the textbook are about the, the history of Asian countries, in my especially China dynasties. Uh, Western Europe, my, it could be almost the same as the uh, my EU member area of the EU, EU member countries and also UK and the uh, uh, United States. Also, information about Ukraine is uh, sometimes linked to the, the history of uh, Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, when, uh, I, uh, when I check the, uh, based on my uh, review uh, of the description of the textbook. And in the case of the uh, geography uh, textbook, my information about Ukraine is my rich, my black soil uh, with agriculture projects, uh, products such as weeds, and science and engineering, steel uh, production, and one of the, uh, the republics uh, which formed my former Soviet Union. So uh, um, therefore, uh, my ordinary education does not provide uh, specific information about Ukraine in Japan, actually. And it could be uh, one of the reasons why, uh, in general, uh, Japan lacks knowledge of Ukraine. It is necessary to start my rebranding work from this point, but this, uh, I think that it is necessary to recognize my, this fact. And uh, uh, under such situation, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that the, the terms uh, former Soviet Union uh, might have a uh, too strong impression to uh, ordinary Japanese. And uh, it may sometimes mislead that uh, the present Ukraine is not so different from the Soviet era. We have to be uh, careful uh, for the term uh, for former Soviet Union in Japan, I think, and to avoid any uh, such a misleading uh, of the image. But however, uh, on the contrary, but it also means that we have still a wide space or wide room for rebranding works in Japan, I think. And secondly, uh, I'd like to uh, think about the common, something common aspect in two countries. And as uh, referred in the commentary, I agree that the food, cuisine, and the traveling are very important too for mutual understanding, especially for Japanese. But in Japan, Majika also uh, periodically uh, holds several cuisine and the cultural exchange events in our training centers located in uh, several uh, prefectures in Japan in collaboration with uh, the uh, embassies, several uh, embassies uh, in Japan. Uh, including the uh, Ukrainian embassy in Tokyo and uh, serving local and traditional food in JICA training facilities. And uh, now it becomes very popular events uh, for the neighboring people living around there. So I believe uh, even such events also contribute to mutual understanding. And why uh, such a cultural aspect, especially cuisine, uh, uh, become the, can be the uh, communication uh, tools and I think one of the important factors is the, for example, the maturation of the agriculture in both two countries. In most of the, my, the history of two countries, uh, and also Japan as well, uh, Japan has been the, uh, the basically the agriculture country uh, in most of its long history, and uh, also Ukraine, uh, if my understanding is correct. Uh, most of the population were farmers, and based on such backgrounds, both of, has, uh, both of us had, have a lot of um, traditional events and variety of foods, cuisine uh, associated with uh, seed number change and agricultural works, such as seeding or harvesting. So uh, we have a lot of, uh, and also we have lots of uh, folklore uh, as well, and uh, uh, understand uh, th there are some, uh, the famous folklore or uh, the story uh, all the stories uh, translated uh, in, in Japan. I think such common culture background and assets will play an important role for effective rebranding works uh, with great uh, sympathy, I think. So uh, finding out, well, this is just a one uh, example and, uh, uh, and I, I hope that my understanding, uh, what, what I mentioned is uh, not a mis my misunderstanding, but uh, Finding out such a common aspects uh, is the very crucial uh, work for rebranding uh, framework. And finally, I'd like to uh, mention about the rebranding approach 
uh, based on the, the limited knowledge about the Ukraine uh, in Japan, uh, it, it is very necessary to be careful enough to select the materials or contents for rebranding. It is not easy to change it once we choose it. Now, considering the long term uh, required for the rebranding re 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 works, it is not a job for one day or one month or one year. Uh, it is also very necessary to consider target group in Japan. Uh, my branding uh, of the country takes time, and I think it is worth my concern to target the younger my generation rather than uh, the elders ones, my, such as myself. And the way of thinking is more, uh, the younger generation in Japan, the way of thinking is much more flexible than elders, and uh, uh, they are good at digital device, and uh, uh, you can, so you can utilize more variety of tools for information dissemination, even under the COVID uh, epidemic situations. At the moment, uh, due to the epidemic of COVID, it is very difficult to conduct rebranding work uh, on face-to-face -face basis. Although it is the most effective tool uh, as referred in the commentary. And in case of uh, JICA's activities, uh, for example, uh, all the my short term training courses are now uh, converted and conducted in, on an online basis instead of uh, dispatching uh, participants to Japan uh, actually uh, before COVID. Uh, even for a short period, uh, such an actual visit and stay uh, in Japan is uh, one of the best ways to uh, form the, the basement of branding and under, uh, based on understanding. And uh, actually, it is also the, the hidden agenda of a uh, JICA training course in Japan. Under such situation, uh, for rebranding re works, uh, we have to uh, reconsider uh, or uh, we, uh, well, uh, not only for the content, but also the effective tools, I think. And before uh, the uh, closing, uh, my comment, uh, I'd like to share the, uh, the Majaika's plan to uh, rebranding Japan in Ukraine, because today's topic is, title is the, the including vice versa. Uh, through academic cooperation to higher education, uh, Majaka will work, uh, work with, uh, is going to work with uh, some university to incorporate and share the, the essence of our experience of Japan's development, especially after major resolutions, uh, and uh, try to uh, incorporate into uh, academic curriculum uh, with uh, provision of uh, educational tools and uh, uh, arrangement lectures by Jaika, uh, etc. Uh, but this plan is still uh, under discussion and premature uh, status, but uh, uh, we expect uh, such an uh, effort would uh, contribute uh, for, to rebranding uh, Japan here and the break, the, uh, uh, breakthrough and become the breakthrough, the, the stereotype in Japan uh, in Ukraine once it would uh, be realized. Uh, that's the end of my uh, comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Sugimoto. Very interesting thinking, very interesting idea that we have to work with the course books and curriculum in that the high school students read. And maybe our embassy has to join in and spread more information about Ukraine in these course books and history books. I also learned about the fact that you um, talk about the reciprocal part of the branding. And I um, agree that in universities and schools, there's still lack of information about history of Japan, especially in the, from the 19th century till today. I think it's um, going to be interesting to learn about economic development of Japan, because there's a lot of things that we could borrow from you and implement in our economy. I'd like to give floor to Olga Homenko. She's uh, in Kiev School of Economy, PhD in philosophy, who uh, studied in Tokyo. And she's probably one of the best specialists uh, in Ukraine about Japan. And in the recent several years, she resided in Boston where she studied in the Fulbright Stipendium, and she had an opportunity to work in Harvard University. So Olga, 
you've um, joined in different projects and you've published school books yourself. You worked on different TV uh, programs for the Japanese TV about Ukraine. You have great experience in this. So I'm confident you have a lot to share. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to talk today in the center of uh, Nova Europa and Hirama Takashi for this wonderful analytical note. And in general, I'm very thank um, I, I'm happy that Ukraine finally uh, turned its face to Asia and Japan in particular. I've read this analytical note and basically I agree with everything what it says there and i would like to say that currently we face the same situation that japan faced after the Meiji restoration and especially after the russian japanese war and for starters i would like to quote one source japan had such intellectual writer okakura kakuzo who in 1904 wrote a book that was called awakening of japan so they had this um, they said that before recently the west didn't take uh, japan seriously now we see that the result of our efforts to take our place in the uh, world of nations see it's seen as a threat how the west perceives us despite of all the information that they have about us and even well informed people do not uh, always understand the depth of our um, restoration and our mutual goals so this quote reminds us of this situation uh, of ukraine in japan because as was rightfully said in the analytical note by mr hirano we have to talk with japan so there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's completely fresh. It's tabula rasa. They know not many things about us. So, and we ourselves have to work actively on rebranding. And we have to talk with Japan, not only in the in their language in the linguistical sense, but talking with understandable cultural codes. Because as we've seen from the analytical note as well, the same words can mean different things or have a different connotation. And also we have, we don't have to forget that we compete with 200 other countries that also uh, come over there with their cultural trade content. And we have to showcase our unique proposals. What uh, we can showcase to compete and what can be of interest to the Japanese. So again, coming back to Restoration Meiji, the Japanese will choose themselves what interests them. After the Meiji, it was traditional that each historical uh, period had uh, their slogan. So Bakunyi-san, Japanese spirit, European technologies. So we have to look for shared points of uh, mutual understanding, what we can give. And we also have to understand that it's a long-term process. Many people uh, want to quick, quick results right now on this market, but we have to first um, gain the Japanese trust to give them understanding that we are a serious, reliable partner who can be dealt with. So, to give to get some kind of a plan for three to five years that has some specific kpis for each three to four months and we have to segment this market and work with each subsequent additionally and it has to be children's um, events games or handmade um, wooden things handmade because they not always uh, remember that literature music cinematography academic segments so vasil said very well about the uh, about inviting scientists so yeah if we have this opportunity would give i would arrange 
uh, summer schools for Ukrainian students, doctor um, students, as Harvard does. For a month, uh, people come together and they have courses in history and language, decorative arts, etc. Something that can be of interest to them. And talking about the specific uh, things, what we can be based on, as Hirano said today, that we are exotic country for uh, the Japanese. Yes, we are, but I would not put it in the slogan because French Polynesia is also exotic, but we are a country, we're a big country with unique culture, with ancient material culture and ancient history. But at the same time, we are a country with the young spirit. If we look at the number of young people at the managerial uh, posts on different uh, industries, different areas, not only now, but in general. So that's what impresses the Japanese. We have film directors, like 30 years old, 25 years old. Uh, there are writers, there are politicians. So despite the, our thousand years history, we are a dynamic and flexible country that is capable of incorporating this young blood. And it's an important element. And another thing that I would say, as you said about embroidery and history, it's a cow, it's a kind of a material object or material cultural code that was created manually for several uh, hundreds of years, uh, centuries. And we have some things to share and to compare with. There is the house uh, religious icon art, iconic art. And also Ukraine can be positioned as the foreign uh, gateway between Europe and Asia. That's what historians also been saying. And we also, we are a hidden gem uh, that was hidden for 70 years behind the cold uh, iron uh, curtain uh, about diplomacy of taste. We are a country of tasty food, of traditional uh, agriculture that feeds not only ourselves, but other countries. And believe me, uh, in many years, there was never a Japanese person that would come to Kiev and would say that it's not a tasty food here. And it's a great indicator. I also have some friends who traveled to Romania, Bulgaria, and they said that they came back through uh, the border back to Ukraine because it's so tasty. Also, separately... traveling Ukraine and the colors of Ukraine, blue sky, yellow wheat and black sea. And it's a country of educated people. We have a very high percentage of people with high education. And that says about some intellectual potential. And also I would denote our uh, history of Cossack movement and natural richness, cultural um, diversity. And we are still unknown country for Japan, but we are very um, hospitable and safe. And we have to take care about that. So if we talk about um, our neighbors, we are a country that says in Japanese, shokunina bunka, as craftsman, craftsmanship culture, prominent. So this material old culture, it has certain historic um, continuity and it can, it is also something that can be sold. So I think that if we talk in this kind of key, in this kind of mode, it not only increases the tourism and cultural exchanges, but also raises an interest from the Jap Japan towards Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. A lot of interesting insights. You spoke about building trust and how we can build this trust that takes time. And we have to have a lot of uh, strength and spirit. A little bit about woodwork, because not many people, uh, not everybody read analytical 
note as you gear company who do these con construction kits out of wood and they're very popular in the world especially in, uh, and also in, in japan and so this craftsmanship and handmade traditions my friend Kirill Yarov, who works now in the embassy, told me a story back in 2005 when he works on world, world big world expo, expo for six months, and and there were some craftsmen coming in from Ukraine doing some handiwork, and it was so popular. And um, the Japanese bought that as hot potatoes. So Petrikivska um, paintings, the embroideries, and all kinds of craft, hand, hand crafts. It's very popular then. We have to think about how to popularize it. I think you create, small Ukrainian businesses can also use that and have online sales of these things uh, over there. And we have to get some help from experts who can help us reach those marketplaces in Japan where these goods can be sold. And I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Okaba Yoshihito, who's a professor in University of Kobe, Hakuin, and he's a president of Association of Ukrainian Studies in Japan. You have the floor. Good morning, I'm Okaba. I'm not so well versed in Ukrainian as he got on the sun, but I, I will try and speak Ukrainian because my teacher in Ukrainian language has been former student here on the sun. In Lviv University. So I will try to demonstrate her teaching skills by speaking Ukrainian. So thank you for inviting me as one of the specialists. And I would like to share some of my ideas. Just recently, I understood that Japanese culture was called Kur Japan. Kur Japan is assistant to soft power. With this uh, modern culture, this world, uh, Japanese anime, pop music, culture, etc. Mr. Okaba, please change this, the channel. So tradition in Korea, Ukraine. So the attempts could seem unexpected, but three facts about Korea, Japan. So we asked Mr. Okaba to change the okay. channel, Ukrainian channel, select Ukrainian channel. Yes, now we can hear. Okay, thank you. So, as I said, Kuru Japan, Kuru Ukraine, and its um, official So, I hope Kuru Ukraine will you will like it as well. So, Three unknown facts. First of all, the embroidery. Do you know that embroidery had been introduced in Japan some five years ago? Some five years ago, I read a lecture about Ukraine in our university. 
then I noticed that some students were dressed in embroidery shirts. And I was really surprised when I talked about Ukrainian culture. Um, I also mentioned the embroidery as well. And those students who I was telling you about just now, they didn't even know that that it was a traditional Ukrainian dress. So after the lecture, I was pleasantly surprised with this new context. So of course, it wasn't ancient traditional embroidery shirts. They were made in China in Eastern European style, but we can say that this also an example of Ukrainian embroidery shirts. And secondly, this borscht. The Japanese know the word borscht, but unfortunately not as a Ukrainian dish, but as a Russian dish. Ashirasan in his book and in his analytical comment has outlined this. And in his book, he provided a great photo and great analytical comment. So considering that almost all Japanese know about borscht, I think we have to be more active in telling the world, the world that the borscht is a Ukrainian dish. Third, Ukrainian produce in Japan. Now we cannot easily buy Ukrainian goods in Japan. Like Violetta said, that in the shop we can find Ukrainian sweets and candy. Just the day before yesterday, my wife bought this small bottle of Ukrainian honey in apothecary. And it's 200 meters from my house. And it's not in Tokyo. So I, I live in small town, but Ukraine is already close to the average Japanese in, in this term. So, but if we be, want to be closer to Japan, many Japanese like to eat pancakes with honey. So more and more people learn about Ukraine if the Japanese will eat pancakes with Ukrainian honey. That means that Ukrainian honey can become a strategic material for the cultural diplomacy and could Ukraine. I hope so. So I, this concludes my presentation. Thank you, thank you. I liked your story about Ukrainian honey that can be bought in the shop in apothecary in Japan. Uh, that shows us globalization in, in Japan and it's great. We have some time for discussion if there are questions from the audience. I will happily give them voice. So I'd like to ask a question about the phenomenon of hobbies in Japan. And maybe the Japanese and Ukrainians can share some reflections on that because that's part of the general context of what we are discussing. So as far as I understand, the Japanese always have their hobbies. They call shumi. They do it, they pursue it. They can be different things, but I, for instance, I learned about this phenomenon that cosplay is when you dress as popular characters from games and films or history. And they imitate what's happening. And so it was born uh, and it was well-developed in Japan. 
this culture is also very well prominent in Japan or in Ukraine, Ukraine like cosplay. Just recently, we had a message that the Japanese play uh, cosplay and they dress in Ukrainian battalions uh, by fighting in Donbass. I don't know if it's the best association with Ukraine, but still there's a war in the east of Ukraine. It's the reality. And the fact that somebody uh, tries to recreate uh, the symbols and what's happening over there as a game, I think it's very interesting uh, to our topic. Again, there can be different things. It can be playing musical instruments. It can be uh, handcrafts. So I would like to hear your uh, ideas. What can be done more in this uh, context? I don't want to whom to address this question, but maybe uh, Mr. Hirano um, to talk about this. And also remind our viewers that if you have questions, please ask. So Hirano. So yeah, thank you. It's an interesting phenomenon in Japan. And by the way, the current soft power in Japan is largely is the subculture, manga, anime, that is even very popular in Ukraine. And Ukrainians like this culture, this cosplay, and it's a large scale phenomenon in Kiev and other cities. They do annual cosplay events and they showcase how they are busy doing that. And also in Japan, it's a small part of society, but they are interested in Ukrainian military topics. I don't know where they get this information, but they do it. They call military costumes, they buy them, they dress up and as a cosplay. So this phenomenon is indeed interesting. It's hard to understand it in terms of Ukrainian elements that can be interesting to Japanese. Because as, uh, as was said, the subculture is very varied. And each, each city or each community has some people who know about this. I would not imagine how Japanese fans would have so much interest in the Azov uh, company, military company and would start even doing this paintings of Ukrainian military in their style. But it is indeed an, int uh, an interest. Even a small part of society, but they do have interest. So there are elements that we may not notice all the time. To have more attention towards Ukraine than now. But again, it's hard to do uh, quickly. I have a question to Mr. Sugimoto regarding businesses and economic cooperation. My question is about agriculture. Do you see a potential of exporting organic produce? Because in Ukraine, organic production is, is developing and we could uh, go for foreign markets. Are there any limitations to sell organic uh, goods in Japan? And secondly, second question is the IT that is very dynamically developing in Ukraine and indeed uh, Japan is technological culture, a technological country. Would like we would like to hear your opinion on that. Yes, Basil. So thank you very much uh, for your question. And uh, I'm not sure I can make a, a good uh, response to that, but I'm a, I try my best. 
It's about the, the potential of agriculture, yes. Uh, my answer is yes, especially for the, the organic foods. Now the, uh, uh, kind of say, uh, a lot of uh, the intention and the, the, the requirement for the, the such organic and uh, the food in Japan is increasing. So uh, yeah, I think that it's, but uh, uh, I think it totally uh, or the greatly uh, depend on the, uh, I say the branding. And uh, uh, Professor Okabe mentioned about the honey and also the uh, embassy of Japan, uh, sorry, embassy of Ukraine in, in Japan, uh, sometimes uh, disseminating the summer cookies or some foods, actually it was uh, made in uh, Ukraine. But uh, uh, regarding the food itself, uh, as far as I understand, my Japanese people, uh, including myself, uh, is a very uh, conservative and they believe in that the domestic product, made in, uh, product, product, uh, product in Japan uh, could be the uh, best or they can, they'd like to rely on that. So uh, and, uh, the branding, uh, uh, for the marketing uh, could be the uh, uh, very uh, critical path, but I think uh, 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 for, for most of Japanese, uh, the Ukraine is, uh, the country Ukraine has a very uh, fresh image and also uh, uh, still uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have the neither uh, so so much negative or so much positive email. So uh, there, uh, I think that the, uh, there could be a good chance uh, to proceed such kind of way. And also for the uh, in the case of IT, yeah, actually I had that the some uh, uh, IT companies is start to have a, a great interest and the potential uh, in Ukraine. And traditionally, uh, not now actually in Japan, uh, they, the labor costs of uh, the engineers uh, become too much expensive. So a uh, lot of IT companies uh, now outsource the, the actual uh, programming uh, work or et cetera to mainly to Asian countries. But now, uh, so previously it was uh, uh, mostly in China actually, but uh, uh, due to some uh, the inclusion of the cost in, in China as well, and the intention of the Chinese government that uh, to concentrate on the the uh, the, the very added goods and uh, some uh, security reasons etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the Japanese company uh, try to diversify uh, their the business base. Uh, from China to other countries. Now spreading to the other ASEAN countries, but uh, in the case of Ukraine, they had a high pot uh, very big potential because in the case of especially IT, the, the geo geographical distance uh, doesn't have a big me uh, meaning. And uh, my, in the case of Ukraine, uh, I came here and uh, I enjoyed very high speed uh, internet and uh, uh, very well uh, facilitated uh, the Wi-Fi uh, environment here. Well, at least in the city areas. So uh, I believe that there's a high, big potential and actually now JICA is conducting uh, some uh, surveys in, in IT areas uh, to push, the, uh, to try to promote uh, the interest of Japanese companies uh, in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to pass the floor to Yuri Lutsenko, who represents a consulting company who deals with helping uh, Ukrainian businesses go into Japanese market. Maybe they have questions or comments. And we have one question from the audience. Maybe Yuri will be able to respond to it at once. And it's about um, knowing about internet platforms in Japan where Japanese share business experience and they're interested in, for, in cooperating with, with the foreigners or some marketplaces like Amazon, or maybe Amazon is present in Japan and, they can, and you can use it, or is it uh, Japanese marketplaces that you can use? So I pass the floor to you for comments and questions. Thank you. Do you can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I have on the background uh, some noises. Sorry, my neighbors are doing some repairs. So 
My name is Yuri Lysenko. I'm partner of the coin company. So what we do, we build relations between Japan and Ukraine in terms of exports of food and agriculture. We've been doing that for four years now. We believe that we are we try to fix te technical issues why some Ukrainian audience don't, cannot hear the speaker now. Yeah, set it for Ukrainian, then you will be audible to everyone. Still inaudible, unfortunately. Yuri, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, now you are audible. Wonderful, thank you. So let me continue. Sorry for this technical hiccup. I was, I switched in a little earlier, a little later, so. So by, we are a little bit of part of the diplomacy but a uh, trade diplomacy, talking uh, with uh, Japanese importers and all the things that we, you've been discussing here. And uh, as Olga said, and Hirano said, and Professor Makabe, and um, Mr. Sugimoto, all of these things are relevant and they, it's all in the, sorts of traders, importers who make money and who can potentially make more money uh, using Ukrainian products that are not in abundance in uh, Japanese stores. And this example with uh, Ukrainian honey is still an exception from the rule, unfortunately. So we're working on that. We try and give it more large scale character. And I would like now to share some two ideas regarding what was said. There is indeed a lot of shared um, aspects between our two cultures, uh, mindsets and history, and those things that you were, you mentioned, those ideas you mentioned, they really can be and should be woven into this general context of promotion. Although it's gonna be difficult when, because we talked about some five, 10 different directions of this diplomacy, it's cultural, culinary, uh, education, it's very important. So that this is also part of the training context. So this is where I'm asking a question, who's gonna do that? Uh, there's a huge hope that Ukrainian Asian strategy that we've heard about, but I haven't read it. I don't know who read it and to what extent it's well uh, described how well is it part of the top countries? So maybe that will help us. So the development, who's interested in development of Japanese-Ukrainian relations? So if not, I don't think these ideas, even if they are bright and interesting, I don't think that they have will have much of an influence on the short-term perspective. As Olga said, five-year plan with KPI, that's the, how, that's the most important in what we're trying to um, achieve because without the plan, nothing is going to be there, and somebody has to own, uh, have to have ownership of this plan. And the KPIs also, somebody has to do progress reports, discussions, corrections, critics. Of course, there's nothing without criticism, so it has there has to be a work of a team, you know, that would be responsible for that, not just amateurs who are talking about that because it's interesting, but interest is not something that moves things. My thinking is that I 
I remember this idea that we had back in the 2018 and we tried to implement it, but it didn't come to pass. So the idea was that we, what do we have to do to have a better promotion of Ukraine uh, in Japan and also reciprocally so that it has a large scale effective. We have to engage influencers. So talking about anime, culture, this military cosplay, we talk about the very narrow audience. They're interesting audience. They do have voice. I don't know how well, uh, how resonant, how much of the noise they can make, but if those uh, audiences have influencers, it will work. If they don't have, it doesn't work. So engaging influencers is the thing number one. And thing number two, is when there's promotion, it must be part of the context of some event. That's where it became, it, it makes some noise. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to remind us all that Olympics, we have Olympics soon, hopefully. We have lost many opportunities through the COVID, the lack of funding, lack of coordination between our agencies. I talked with Konstrinsky and they said, nobody talked to them about the Olympics still. So that's the reality. But if this, if we had, if we were in 2019, my idea was to get Bobka on board, Shevchenko and other famous Ukrainian sportsmen so that they in a cultural or culinary context would be promoting Ukraine. You, you mentioned several times that borscht is a Russian dish for the Japanese and that's no surprising because Russians, they have an influence through media. Their channels are there. We don't have these channels, but we have, we have to have influencers and that the messages that we put and the influencers put naturally in the media regarding Ukraine, that they would be in the context of Olympics or Expo 2020, 2025. And we have enough time for that. Yeah, I think it's great idea. Sorry for interrupting you, but we're running out of time. Great comments overall. And we had a nice, very nice discussion. We talked about so many important and interesting things that Ukraine and Japan can work towards in order to improve the perception of each other in our countries. It's a titanic amount of work and without the plan, without some specific movements and, and funding, it's not gonna happen. So we still don't know. There will be a third discussion on Friday I would like to invite uh, Alona Hitmanchuk, director of the Center of Nova Europa, for final words. Alona, please. So I would just like to say thanks on behalf of our center, all to all the participants, to all the speakers, to Mr. Takashi Hiramo for a wonderful comment that has motivated us so well to have a lively discussion. And yeah, we planned to have a follow-up of the forum with the more detailed steps and proposals about rebranding. And I think it's a success. Thank you to Vaksil Miroshnichenko for a very professional moderation. It was also very interesting to hear all the participants from Kiev and from Tokyo. So culinary accents were surprising. Culinary diplomacy is really important in Japanese context, maybe, or it's probably Kiev is close to lunch and Tokyo is close to dinner. I don't know, but I think it's, it was noticeable. And I was very happy about the news from the embassy that there are plans to open Ukrainian restaurant in Japan because when I was in Kyoto, I was really uh, negatively surprised Kiev restaurant as a Russian menu and they 
in the Japanese talk about as a Russian restaurant. So it's an example that Kiev is a restaurant, but for from Russians, it talks about perception and about specifics of how to work in Japan. This is um, visible from the fact that the only ambassador in the world, the media interview about his Twitter account, not about Ukraine, not about some global events, and, but about his Twitter account. That shows about specifics of Japan and that there has to be a different approach, uh, different from other countries of Asia, not just the world. So I'm very, very happy and thankful for this discussion. And I would like to invite you all for the subsequent discussion on Friday, because this is a discussion marathon, we call it. And 19th of March. So it's going to be a discussion about trade. Because today we've already bridged. We arrived at this topic, the trade for Ukrainian companies, the Japanese market and reciprocally. So we're going to talk about that on Friday. I'm confident that it's going to be about honey and not only honey. So you're all invited. We start as, uh, as well at 10 a.m. Kiev time, 5 p.m. Tokyo time. Thanks a lot.